Hello, my name is Matthew Newsom, and I'm working with Kevin Verano to bring you this course, Mastering Django Web Development. Together, Kevin and I have 10 years experience creating Django-based web apps in both the startup and corporate sectors. Some apps we've published handle millions of page views per day and are managed by a team of dedicated developers. The material in this course will help you create better Django web applications and APIs as your project gets a little more ambitious. If you're new to Django, consider the video course Learning Django Web Development by me, Matthew Newsom. However, anyone who has created basic Django applications like those shown in the official Django tutorial will find this video helpful. Throughout this course, one of the major themes we'll cover is the dry concept, which is fundamental to Django. Dry stands for don't repeat yourself, and it means that we should be writing smart code that can grow with our project. When my early Django project started to grow in size, there was a lot of duplication and poor organization. It made my code fragile and hard to manage. I learned a lot of lessons the hard way, which resulted in wasted effort, poor application performance, and sometimes unplanned downtime. With this course, you'll learn techniques to help you avoid the same problems. We'll discuss using powerful class-based views, custom middleware, creating our own template tags and filters, building a RESTful API, advanced database modeling, taking control of caching, using model managers, and developing custom manage.py commands. We won't be creating a single application in this course. Instead, we'll focus on specific examples of advanced techniques where each of these techniques can be put to use. If you download the provided sample code, you'll see that there's one Django project per section in the series. This will make it easier for you to experiment with the code and see how it works. In this video series, I'll be using Python 2.7. If you have a newer version of Python, you will have to make some minor changes to the code, but the principles will still apply. The code samples are based on Django 1.8, but should work with newer versions of Django. Since 1.8 is an LTS version, it's a good idea to use it for serious projects since it will receive security updates for quite some time. In this first section, we'll discuss class-based views. We'll start out by extending a generic class-based view, then we'll create our own mixin, we'll build a custom class-based view, and finally, create a switchboard style view that combines the functionality of several views into one. Let's talk about generic class-based views. In section four of the official Django tutorial, you learn about generic class-based views. It's pretty amazing to see these in action. You get a lot of functionality with a little bit of code. As a matter of fact, in some simple apps, you don't need any view logic at all. It doesn't take long to outgrow this stage, so let's discuss how we'll use a generic view to manage your data. In this view, you see that we have one generic class-based view in use here, author update, that extends the update view. You'll see that all we have to do is associate a model and say what fields we want. And this update view now works. Sometimes you want to do a little more. For example, you might want to modify the context variable. In that case, you have to override or extend one of the built-in methods. In this case, we're going to override the getContextData method. You see here that we have to call the super function and tell it to call the getContextData function from the base class. Then we're going to add a variable to it called form2. So that's all it takes to extend an existing generic class-based view. This view is built into Django, but in your apps, you'll probably extend this to add some functionality. In the next video, we'll do just that using mixins. A common scenario is that you have multiple views that work in a similar way. One of the goals with class-based views is to reduce code duplication. You know, the dry principle. In this video, we'll discuss how mixins can help with that. Most of the built-in generic class-based views are made by combining several mixins. For example, the built-in detail view uses the single object mixin, the template response mixin, and the single object template response mixin. We can follow their example and create a mixin that provides key functionality that we'll use on several of our class-based views. It turns out that creating your own mixins isn't hard. This lets you write a mixin once and use it in several different views, so let's do that. Here in my editor, in my application, I created a file called mixins.py. Here I created a class that extends object. That's all it does, and it defines a method, in this case, dispatch. Dispatch must be defined in the class I'm going to include this mixin in. I'm going to call the superclass versions. I'm going to call the superclass version of dispatch. 
If I include this in a class that doesn't have a dispatch, then I'll get an exception. That won't be a problem, you'll see in just a moment. In here what I do is check to see if a user is staff, and if not, then I make an error message, then I do a redirect back to the referrer, or in case there's no referrer to the home page. That's all there is to it. Now in my views, you'll see here that I've imported my only staff mixin, and then when I define the new class, I use that mixin. Now the dispatch method that's going to get called will start out by being called from my only staff mixin. And then, because I'm calling the super classes version, it'll be called as well. By the way, if mixins and multiple inheritance are new to you, check out section 9.5.1 of the official Python documentation. I'd never heard of this feature until I started getting deeper into Django. Okay, now you know how to make a mixin. In the next video, let's add some more custom behavior to our own class-based views. One of the most common tasks people do with our web applications is view content. So let's create a new class-based view that focuses on that functionality. Unlike the previous views we've used, this will not be based on a generic view. One of the simplest and most commonly used base classes is the view class. A view class typically implements one or more methods named after the common RESTful verbs, such as get or post. It makes sense to extract application logic out of the get method in order to keep our code simple and manageable. In this example, you'll see here we have our get method. We define the context, and then we call out to these custom methods to get the total and the tax. Then our get view does a typical render or render to response, whatever is appropriate. Notice here that we're inheriting from the view class. This is not a generic view. This is a very simple view, but it is completely custom to our application. You see now how to extend the view class to create our own custom view. This really isn't earth shattering, but let's supercharge our view by making it a switchboard class for multiple related tasks. On many web apps, there are a few views that are closely related and work on the same set of data. It makes a lot of sense to group this code together into a single class to avoid duplication. There's that dry principle again. Your project may benefit from using a switchboard style class. This is a single class that has the methods to deal with all of the functionality related to a certain data set. The key concept with this class is that it uses the often misunderstood get adder function of Python to call the proper method on the class. In this example, we're creating a simple RESTful API. It's going to use a class-based view called process payment, and it inherits from the view-based class. It's a lot like the one we just demonstrated. We have a get amount function that returns a JSON response. We have a get tax method that also returns a JSON response, and the response contains a few keys that are related to taxes. We have a get discount method, again returning a JSON response with data related to the discount. Then we have an unknown method that does a redirect. And then here is our get verb. Here we're going to define a handler variable. We'll use get adder to get the method from self from this class that begins with the word get underscore and then grabs the value of operator. If this value doesn't exist, then it's going to return unknown, which is what we define here. So essentially, if operator is amount, then handler will be get amount. Then we return the function call of the handler. So again, if operator is amount, then we'll return a JSON response that includes the amount. This way, what you can do is group related functions together into one class and have your different methods all operate on the same data set. In order to make this work, over in your urls.py, you've got to somehow capture the operator and pass it in. So in this case, we'll assume that the path includes the operator. So for example, the path may be tax, and then that gets captured in the operator variable. Then we call views process payment as view, just like we do with all of our class-based views. In that case, one of our keyword arguments will be operator. In our code, I'll admit that the examples here are a little contrived, and in your own code, I expect they'd be a bit more advanced than we're using here. I hope you see how you can use these class-based views to better organize your application and reduce code duplication. In this section, we covered class-based views and how they're built using mixins. Then we created our own mixin. Then we created a new basic view and then enhanced it with our own view logic. Finally, we used the get adder to create a switchboard method and then update our urls.py file to pass in variables when calling our class. 
In the next section, we're going to tackle another advanced Django topic, custom middleware. Let's start section two. In this section, we're going to cover middleware. We'll talk about how it works, what hooks are called, and when they're called, how to create custom middleware, and how to use middleware to catch unhandled exceptions. In this video, we'll focus on how middleware works and the various hooks we can target with our middleware. As we can see in the Django documentation, middleware is code that hooks into the request response cycle of a page view. Think of it like a plugin for your Django app. There are quite a few built-in Django plugins, for example, sessions, CSRF protection, and authentication. Pretty much every app will use at least one piece of middleware, the built-in common middleware. If you've ever observed how Django automatically adds a slash to URLs, you can thank common middleware. If you have some code that runs on multiple pages of your site, consider if middleware is a good choice to help you not repeat yourself. You can see here that a typical Django app will have several middleware handlers defined. Note that the order they're specified is important because they're processed in this order. In this case, session middleware is first in the stack and security middleware is last. In the next video, we'll write some middleware, but before we do that, it's helpful to know that each middleware function can respond to one of five hooks. The hooks are process request, which happens to each and every request, even before Django knows what view will be executed. This can be used to short circuit further processing. For example, if you want to block certain browsers from accessing your site. Process view, which happens when Django has figured out what view will be called. This could be useful if you want to convert old URLs to new ones. The process template response hook is called right after the view has finished if the response has a render method. That means that it won't be called if you're viewed as a redirect, for example. That can be useful if you want to do something before a template is rendered. Process response is called on all responses just before returning to the browser. It is always called even if you short circuited some of the middleware or even the view. Lastly, there's this process exception hook, which happens when the view function raises an exception. This can be very helpful if you want to log details about an unhandled error and then show the end user a generic oops page. There's one more important thing to note about middleware and the order of execution. We see that the middleware that happens after the view function is called is handled in reverse order. So on the request side, common middleware is processed first, but on the response side, it's handled last. In the next video, you'll see that writing middleware is actually quite easy. I think the two most used middleware hooks are process request and process exception. So I'll demonstrate each of these. In this video, we'll cover process request. Middleware is a class that defines one or more methods that correspond to one of the hooks mentioned in the last video. We'll create a simple class called user profile middleware. And we'll define a method called process request that accepts the request. Because we're using the process request hook, this method will be called on each and every request unless an earlier request stops it. In the case of process request, we can stop the view handler and all of the rest of the request middleware from being called if we return an HTTP response object. For example, a redirect. This middleware won't need to do that, so we need to ensure that we simply return none. We have to do one or the other though either none or an HTTP response. As you might have guessed from the name, this middleware will try to get the user's profile out of the cache. If the user is logged in and the profile exists, we'll attach it to the request. Notice here that the first thing we do is check to see if the user is authenticated. If not, we simply return none. This middleware is now done. If the user is logged in, then we'll keep going and try to get their profile out of the cache. If that doesn't work, then we'll fetch their profile and then cache it. Note that it's possible that the profile does not exist, so we'll handle that here and create an empty profile. This is an empty function. You'd replace this with the actual code that you would use to create the new profile, which can vary depending on which version of Django you're using. Now that we have a valid profile, we attach it to the request and then return none. The next middleware in view will have access to the user profile as part of the request object. Now to enable it, we need to visit settings.py. We'll look at the middleware classes configuration. Since we're using the user.isAuthenticated method, we need to do this after the session and authentication middleware. There's no compelling reason to put this before these, so we'll just add it to the end. Do note that in some cases, the order does matter. For example, you may need to do this before the authentication. For example, you may want your middleware to run before authentication. I also want to point out that we only defined one method the one for process request. 
It may be that the middleware actually handles multiple hooks, in which case it's okay to have multiple methods. And likewise, it could be that I want to extract some of my code into smaller methods, in which case I'm fine as long as I don't accidentally name my method after one of the hooks. Also note that it doesn't matter if we're using a new style or simple Python classes. Either one will work fine. In the next video, we'll make middleware for handling exceptions. Let's talk about something you should always use in your apps. Middleware to handle exceptions. Normally, all of your exceptions are handled, right? All right, sometimes an exception may sneak through. Well, as you'll see here in just a second, this is so easy and the benefits are so good, it's foolish not to use this middleware hook. Like in the last video, our middleware is pretty simple. We simply need to create a class that has a method for the proper hook. In this case, the process exception hook. This method accepts two parameters, the request and the exception. In this example, we'll simply check to see if the exception is an app error, and if so, we'll redirect to the home page. Otherwise, we return none. We need to add this to the list of middleware in settings.py. Note that for the process exception hook, the order is bottom to top. There isn't really a big concern about the order in which this one is called, so we'll just keep it at the bottom. Here's how we might use this in a view. We check to see if the user is staff. If not, we raise an app error. Since this exception isn't being handled in this view, it bubbles up to the middleware, where it'll get caught. That's it for middleware. The two examples we've covered in this section are quite common, and you might already be thinking about how you can simplify some of your apps by using these techniques. In the next section, we'll create custom template tags and filters. In this section, we'll discuss custom template tags and filters. We'll start out with filters, since they're simpler. Then we'll cover template tags. You've probably used filters in your templates. One that people often try out at first is upper. We can see how it works here. We display a variable, but then we add a pipe, and then at the end, the name of the filter. Some filters can take a parameter. For example, the date filter takes a string that describes a date format. In this case, you'd use the pipe, the filter name, and then a colon and the parameter in quotes, like this. In order to create your own filters or template tags, your app has to have a module called template tags. And yes, it does need the init.py file. If you have a set of filters and template tags that you use on multiple projects, you can create a Django app just for these template tags. In that case, the app still needs to be installed in the settings.py file. What you name your files inside the template tags folder doesn't matter. In this case, I'll put my filters inside of a file called filters.py. However, it's no problem at all if I called this file fred.py. Likewise, I can have multiple files for my filters so that related filters are in the same one. In my filter module, I need to import the template module from Django. This will allow me to use the register decorator. To create a filter, I just define a function that takes one or two values, and then I decorate it with register.filter. In these cases, I'm also specifying that the isSafe property is true, to let Django know that I've already checked my strings to ensure they're safe. I'm actually lying because I haven't checked Publisher to see if it's clean. In your own projects, be sure to check the HTML your filter returns to ensure it's clean. If you're not sure that your markup is safe, set it to false and Django will escape potentially unsafe characters. You can learn more about this in the custom template tags documentation. The first filter doesn't take a parameter. It simply takes a variable that my template passes in and then assigns it to the value publisher. My filter is called publisher underscore link. So to use it in my template, I would add the pipe symbol followed by publisher underscore link. The value of publisher will be passed into my function. Before this will work though, I need to load the filters. The reason I'm saying load filters here is because I named my file filters.py. If I had named it fred.py, then instead I would say load fred. My second filter is called YouTube embed, and it does accept a parameter. The URL will be passed in as the variable, and if the embed should be HD, then I'll pass in true with a colon. I think you see now that this is not rocket science. The main issue that I run into is that I forget to create a module called template tags. And sometimes I forget to add my app to the installed apps in settings.py. 
I make one of these two mistakes pretty much every time. Once I do remember to add the app, everything works fine though. In the next video, let's create template tags. Template tags are a lot like filters, so make sure you've got a firm understanding of the last video's content. In this video, we'll cover creating template tags. Tags can do more than filters can, and they make it easier to do more complicated things. For example, one of the filter examples was to display YouTube embed code. In reality, I would use a tag for that. Tags come in a few varieties, and there are two common varieties. They can simply process a little data and return it, or they can include and render templates, much like a view. We'll cover both of these styles. Kevin and I are both big fans of the Bootstrap Toolkit, so we'll create two template tags that can make using Bootstrap easier. Bootstrap is a set of CSS and HTML that gives you nice, professional, and clean-looking pages. If you're like me, the first thing I do when prototyping a new app is to look up the URL for a CDN for Bootstrap. Let's just make a template tag for that instead. Like with filters, I use the register function, this time to register a template library. Then we decorate a function called Bootstrap CSS with the register.simpleTagDecorator. This is great for simpler tags. Notice that this function simply returns, like with the filters, I use the register function, this time to register a template library. Then we decorate a function called Bootstrap CSS with the register.simpleTagDecorator. This is great for simpler tags. Notice that this function simply returns two HTML tags. When I look at the template, I load the tags just like I loaded the filters. Again, I say tags here because my file is named tags.py. I can call that file anything I want, but I have to ensure the name matches my load statement. Here in the head of my document, I call my new template tag. When I view it in my browser, see that it was replaced by the output of that function? Pretty simple, right? Let's get more complex. The coolest part of Bootstrap are all of the widgets that come included. My favorites are the buttons. A button has a style and the text that's in the button. So in my tags file, I'll create a new function called bootstrap underscore button and decorate it with the register dot inclusion tag. This time I have to pass in the name of a template. The normal template inclusion rules apply. This template is called bootstrap underscore button dot HTML. Note that my function expects text, which is the clickable button text, and a style, but a default value is provided. Inside my function, I do something that may look a little odd. I simply return a dictionary with some data. I can do more processing. For example, I could check that the style is one of the seven that Bootstrap expects, or I could do a database query or any other valid Python code. In the end, though, I'm just going to return a dictionary. This dictionary becomes the context data for this template. When we take a look at Bootstrap button, we see that it uses the style and the text variables, just like your typical template would. In my index file, I've created a few buttons. The first one only defines text, no style. It will become a default button. Then I define a danger button. And then lastly, a link button. When we look at this in the browser, we see the three different buttons shown, just like you'd expect. Keep in mind that Bootstrap has far more complicated controls, for example, menus and modals. You can create some more complicated template tags in order to help make these even easier. I will point out that there are two more kinds of template tags that you may use. The first kind is one that I've never used in real life, the assignment tag. It's useful when your tag needs to change a value. The second is a tag that has a start and end, for example, the if and end if tags that are part of Django. Both of these types of tags are built on the same information we've demonstrated in this video already. So if you find yourself needing these tags, I think you'll find the documentation easy to grasp. One final comment. If you really like the idea of a Bootstrap tag library, before you create your own, check out the Django Bootstrap 3 module on PyPI. That ends this section. We've covered creating our own filters and template tags. In the next section, we'll build a REST API. More and more apps are being built with the advanced front-end tools such as AngularJS, Ember, Backbone, and more. These tools access data using REST APIs, usually exchanging data in JSON format. In this section, we'll discuss how to easily add a RESTful API to your Django applications. We'll introduce TastyPy and how it will expose your models as REST resources. Then we'll add some additional data and query options to our API, and then add authentication, 
so that we can do create, read, update, and delete methods on our data. First, we'll install TastyPy, and then we'll create a basic API. Let's start with TastyPy. This is an add-on module for Django that makes it easy to add an API. It can do a lot, way more than we can cover in this video series, but we'll demonstrate the features you're most likely to need. Before we can do much, we need to install TastyPy. I'm using a virtual env, but that's not required. The steps are the same either way. Simply use pip to install the module named Django TastyPy. If you just try to install TastyPy, it will warn you that there are no matching versions. You need Django-TastyPy. In this app, I've created models for a music collection. You can see here that I have artist, album, and song. I've also enabled the admin area. And I've created an artist who happens to be my daughter and some songs that she loves to sing. Before using the sample data, you'll want to use the create super user command to add a new user to the database. Something that you may not do very often is create model managers. For now, just copy my example and we'll talk more about managers in a later section. This is going to add some more advanced filtering capabilities to our models, which we'll need in the next video. Now let's get to the fun part. We need to create a file called api.py in our application. Here we import model resource, which is the most useful feature of TastyPy. It will do most of the work to expose our model as an API. If you have some other data you want to expose that doesn't come from a model, then you could just use resource, which does the same thing but without a model. We import our models and then the fields from TastyPy. We also import API, which is a utility of TastyPy to gather resources together into a single API. The next part looks a lot like when you register your models to use them in the admin area. We'll create a class for each of our models that we want to expose as part of the API. Note that for album, we need to tell TastyPy about our foreign key relationship to artist, and for song, we need to tell about both the foreign keys for artist and album. Then we create an API. We'll call it v1, and then register our resources with it. This won't be very useful until we add it to our urls.py. So we'll import our API, and then include the v1 API URLs. Now, if we open our browser, we can visit API forward slash v1 forward slash song question mark format equals JSON and then see our songs. It's pretty ugly, so let's use Postman. Postman is a browser plugin for Chrome that lets you fiddle with APIs. You'll see that it returns objects album, artist, the resource URL, and then the title of the song, Jingle Bells or blah, blah, black sheep. Okay, we did a lot here, so feel free to review the code samples and experiment with your own data. In the next video, we'll enhance our service slightly with some custom queries. What we demonstrated in the last video will work with most apps. AngularJS, Backbone, and other tools can understand how to deal with APIs of this sort pretty easily. But sometimes it's more efficient if the server can just tweak the data a little bit or allow you to do a little work on the server before sending the data. In this video, I'll show you how to do more advanced queries with TastyPy. TastyPy has a dehydrate cycle, which essentially means that it takes the data from a model or some other resource and prepares it to be serialized for the API. We're going to customize that to separate the year out into its own field so that we can work with it more easily. We're also going to customize the filtering so that we can view only the albums released in a certain year. We'll start by adding two extra imports. The first is invalid filter error, so that we can raise an exception in case of a bad request. And then we'll also grab date time, since we'll be working with years. We're going to add three methods to our album API. The first is the dehydrate method. Doing this simply adds one new bit of data to the results, the year of the album. When we check it in Postman, we see that now the year is available. We'll also add these two methods, which look for a filter and, if present, modifies the query. In this case, we look for a year. And if so, we check that the album was released between January 1st and December 31st of that year. I've adjusted the urls.py so that with this one, we're now using part two instead of part one to get our API URLs. The only file relevant in this app is the api.py. The rest we're still getting from the part one files. Now, if we test our query in Postman, we have the ability to check for albums released in a certain year 
by appending a query parameter. Now, if I chose a past year, I see no results. But if I choose 2015, then I do get this album, which was released in 2015. At this point, you now have the tools you need to do just about everything you want with a read-only API. In the next video, we're going to take it up a big notch by adding authentication so that we can allow create, update, and delete support as well. We've built a read-only API, but many would also like to have what is commonly referred to as CRUD support. This is an API that allows creating reading, updating, and deleting of data. This isn't too hard, but we need to be extra cautious because we don't want just anyone to have this capability. We're also going to need authentication support. TastyPy offers several authentication methods. If you're simply creating single-page apps with AngularJS or similar, you can probably use session authentication, which works just like your standard HTML apps. If you're simply creating single-page apps with AngularJS or similar, you can probably use session authentication, which works just like your standard HTML apps. However, if your API will be accessed by mobile apps or other servers, you'll want to use key-based authentications. We'll create a mixin that adds the support we need. First, in our API, we need to import API key authentication and Django authorization. Then we'll create our mixin class. You'll see this isn't too complicated, which is nice, because I like when it's not complicated. Now we just need to add the mixin to our three resource classes. That wasn't hard, was it? Well, actually, there is one more step. The API key authentication functionality does require a model. So we have to add tastypy to our installed apps. Don't forget to run manage.py migrate. Once we do this, you'll see that we have a new model in our admin area, which allows us to create or revoke APIs. This is a little too basic for most advanced apps, but it is nice and simple to get us started. Once you outgrow this, it would be not too hard to create a new view that allows the user to authenticate and generate or revoke their key. For now, I'll create a new API key. I'll select my name from the list, and then I'll hit Save and Continue Editing. You'll see that the key field is auto-populated with a long, ugly key. Make note of that because we'll need it. When we check our API, you'll see that we get a 401 error indicating that we're not authorized to read data. We need to add an authorization header. When we check our API, you'll see that we get a 401 error indicating that we're not authorized to read data. We need to add an authorization header. The value of the header should be API key space and then username colon and then that long key that we copied. Now when we hit send, we get our data. Let's reap the benefits of our work. Here we see our list of songs. Let's add one to it. We'll start by changing the method from get to post. Then using postman, we'll switch to raw mode and then make sure we're set to JSON. For this to work, we have to also add a content type header of application JSON. Now we'll put in some data. The required fields are album, artist, and title. We'll call it just happy birthday for now. When we submit the form, we'll see a 202 status, which means that our record was created. If we look at the response headers, we'll see that there is a location header, which is the reference to the newly created song. If we change the method to patch, and then change the URL to that newly created song, we can change the title. This time when we submit, we get a 202 status, which simply means it worked. If we switch back to get, we'll see that our song does exist and it does have the new title. One last test. We'll change the method to delete. We don't need any JSON data, but it won't hurt if it's there. The 204 status indicates that it worked. If we change the method to get and leave the URL set to the song, you'll see that we get a 404 not found, which means that the data doesn't exist anymore. If we go back to the song API, 
you'll see that indeed there are only the first two songs there. So there we have it. We now have a fully functional and useful API. To recap what we've covered, we created a new API based on our models, then we made it more advanced so that we could add the year as a field and then filter on it. Then we added authentication support, which allows full CRUD support. In the next section, we'll move on to some more advanced database modeling. As you start to build non-trivial apps, you'll occasionally feel constrained by the limits of the database techniques demonstrated in most Django tutorials. The great news is that you actually have a lot of power available to you if you just dig a little deeper, and that's what we'll do in this section. We'll start out by discussing generic relationships. Then we'll work on using advanced form sets to make data management easier. Then we'll cover how to do advanced queries using the Q function. In this video, we'll focus on generic relationships. In the last section, we created a song database. There was a model for artists, albums, and songs. Suppose you wanted to add a favorites feature where you could see a list of your favorite songs, artists, and albums. You could do three queries and combine the results in Python, but wouldn't it be nice if there was a way to not repeat ourselves? Django has the concept of generic relationships. These are just like a foreign key relationship, but the join is done with Python, not in the database itself. Using the example of our favorites, our code would look just like a typical foreign key reference, but in reality, Django would do the multiple queries and combine the results. Let's look at the code. We'll start with the models from the last section, but we'll add two imports. One for content type and one for generic foreign key. Then we'll add a new model called favorite, and this time we'll add a generic foreign key called item. We can insert the data into the favorites model just like any other model. Note that we're relying on the content type frameworks here. It's important to include that reference as part of our model. Also note that performance can vary. It's imperative that the key used to join the two tables be either the same data type or one that can be coerced to the same type. For best results, use the same type. Also note that this relationship cannot be reversed automatically. If I wanted to do that, I'd need to create another generic relation from the secondary tables back to the first. In this example, I'd need to make a relationship from song back to favorites, from artist back to favorites, and from album back to favorites. You'll have to decide if this is worth the effort for you. That's it for this video. Let's discuss form sets in the next video. Sometimes you want to have multiple forms on the same page in order to allow adding many records at once. For example, say you bought a new album and wanted to add a dozen songs in one shot, or you want to edit the last five records in a database at once with two extra blank forms so that you can add up to two new records. This is probably easier to explain if you see it first. Here's what we're going to create. This is a form that lets us add up to five new records at once. We also have another version of this where we can update existing records and add new ones. This takes surprisingly little code. Form sets are what make this so easy. Let's look at the HTML that generates our form. The HTML is used by both the create and update form, and there's not much to it. We have to include the call to form.managementForm. This will inject some hidden form fields that Django needs. After that, you'll see that we loop through a form variable, adding the fields for each form. We're using the exact same models from the last video with the only new code being a couple of generic views. Let's start with the create form because it's a little simpler. We call it bulk songs and it inherits from the form view. Then we set the form class to be a model set factory. It accepts a model song and then the number of extra blank forms we want, in this case five. Starting with Django 1.8, we must specify either fields or exclude. In this case, I'm going to use fields, and we want the fields for title, artist, and album. We also have to specify the template, song form, which is that HTML file we just looked at. We need to have a form valid function. This processes a form if it's valid. You'll see that we're using the messages framework to add helpful messages indicating success. Then we redirect back to the same page. On success, we'll get a new blank form with a success message at the top. Finally, we're overriding the get form keyword args method. The only thing we're doing here is changing the query set to be an empty set. There are no records for the create form. This gives us a blank form. Let's flip back to our browser and compare the difference between the create form with the update form. In the update form, we already know the album, 
So instead of adding an album column, we're adding a delete column. For this, we have a form view class called update album. We'll build our form class with inline form set factory, which works exactly the same except it takes, in this case, the album and song models. I chose to use the exclude parameter so that you can see how it works. It doesn't matter which one you use, either exclude or fields, but you do have to use one of them. Form valid is the same, but you'll notice that the get form keyword args function is a little bit different. Obviously, we don't want an empty set of records on the update form, so here we grab the album ID and then use the get object or 404 method to fetch the records. This works just like you'd expect. If you choose an invalid album ID by fooling around with the URL, you'll get a 404 error. Lastly, we're adding the get context data. In this case, we're adding a variable called call3, which is set to delete question mark. The HTML template checks to see if this is here, and if so, uses it as column header. That's all the fun, but here's the urls.py. You'll see that we're simply using it like we would any other generic view. Now you know how we create bulk edit forms in Django. This will give you powerful data entry capabilities. In the next video, let's use the queue function to do sophisticated queries. In this video, we'll talk about doing advanced queries. To some people, this may mean writing raw SQL. We won't be covering that here because doing so causes us to lose some of Django's benefits. If you want to write SQL, then you'll want the raw function. Sometimes you have something more complicated that just doesn't work with the standard ORM. For me, the most common problem is when you want to use an OR condition. I have good news for you, Django makes this very easy. Even though we can often get by with the standard ORM syntax, and using the Q function feels a little scary, you'll see that it works quite well. Use model.objects.filter or model.objects.get just like you would normally, but for the parameters, pass in one or more Q functions. If you use more than one, they should be either anded or ORed together. When you do that, the result is combined into one. You can use parentheses to get the correct logic if you want more complex operations. Let's use an example. In this case, I'm going to open a Django shell and import our song model and the Q function. If I just type Q, PK equals one, you'll see the result, and as you'd expect, a Q object. This represents objects that are anded together. If I put an OR between two Q objects, for example, Q, PK equals one, OR, Q, PK equals two, then we see a single Q object that is an OR of both parameters. What if we want to look for songs that have either PK equals one or PK equals two and starts with ba? If we try Q, PK equals one or Q, PK equals two and Q title underscore underscore starts with equals Ba, we don't get what we'd expect. In this case, it would look for either pk equals 1 or both pk equals 2 and starts with ba. We need parentheses instead. Let's see how this works with our data. Now let's see how this works with our data. We'll do models dot song dot objects dot filter q pk equals one or q pk equals two voila we get two records returned if you want to use a standard object filtering notation combined with the q function you can you just need to ensure that the q object is the first parameter and we get one result because the Q object was anded with starts with. In this section, we covered how to create generic relationships to do more complicated queries while still getting the benefits of the ORM. Then we discovered how to do bulk creation and editing of records using form sets. Finally, we made our queries more sophisticated using the Q method. In the next section, we'll cover caching. Caching is an important part of almost every modern application. Ultimately, it provides the ability for your application to scale to handle more users, though there may be other benefits in some applications. In this section, we'll discuss three types of caching. 
We'll start with low-level caching. In this video, discuss caching with middleware, and finally look at how to take control of template caching. Let's start out by discussing low-level caching and the simplest caching driver. Low-level caching may sound difficult, but it's not. It just means that we have the option to control what gets cached. This is great because some things are more cacheable than others. Before you can use caching, you have to configure it. The two fastest cache backends are memcached, which is built into Django, and Django Redis Cache, which is an add-on for Django, using the Redis key store. Redis and memcached are separate server processes, and they are key value data stores, kind of like a dictionary. That means that you do have to manage another process on the server. If you'd rather not go for that, a great way to start out is to use your database as a cache backend. This will turn slow, complex operations into fast, simple database queries, and it's the easiest one to get started with. In your settings.py, you will create a caches dictionary and set the backend and location properties for the default dictionary. Here's the documentation on how to configure the database as a backend. In your settings.py, you will create a caches dictionary and set the backend and location properties for the default dictionary. Here's the documentation on how to configure the database as a backend. The location is the database table you want to use. When you use a database backend, you need to use the python manage.py create cache table command to prepare the database. At this point, you can use the cache at any time with the cache.get and cache.set functions. Set takes two parameters, a key and a value, while get takes a key and a default value to return if no matching keys are found. We know that most web application data is viewed more often than it's changed. For example, several people will look at the list of songs in our database without making any changes. We also know that people are a little more patient when making changes to data than when viewing it. Therefore, it's often sensible to speed up the viewing of data, even if it makes changing the data slower. Here's a way to make displaying the data load quickly from the cache. We'll create a new detail view class called cache detail view. First, a common optimization is to use a select related method to fetch related data. This overcomes issues with lazy loading being slow. Here in our get object definition, we try first to get the data from the cache using cache.get. We take the model name, lowercase it, then combine it with the primary key. We default to none if the cache doesn't contain a key that matches. Then we check to see if the object exists. If it's none, we'll do the original database query and then stash the result back in the cache. Now we can use this below and make a new generic view for showing song details. Instead of using the detail view, we're using our newly created cache detail view. There is a problem here. We have no cache expiration. That means if our data changes, the changes will never be shown. We'll always be using the cache data. Django actually makes this scenario very easy. If we go to our models, we can override the save method. We'll add a little extra behavior to wipe out the cache whenever the data is saved. That's just one very practical example, but it demonstrates the point of using cache get and cache set. Any operation, not just database queries, can be cached. In the next video, we'll move up a layer in the stack and look at caching with custom middleware. Back in section two, we looked at creating custom middleware. We created an example class that would fetch the user profile and add it to the request so that it could be accessed automatically. In this video, we'll discuss using middleware to help us with caching. I'd strongly suggest checking out the Django Debug Toolbar, which is a tool that helps you see what is happening inside your app. It was discussed in detail as part of my other Django video course called Learning Django Web Development, published with Pact. You may see that on every page of your website, a database query is done to fetch the user profile. Why do all this work? How hard would it be to add caching support to our custom middleware? Well, you just saw in the last video that caching is not hard. Here's one way to do it. The total code is under 20 lines to get the basic functionality. You'll see that we're hooking into process request. If they're not authenticated, we quickly step out. Then we try to pull the profile from the cache. If it exists, we set it in the request and return none. If not, we'll fetch it from the database, cache it, and then add it to the request, and then finish. Keep in mind that this technique can cache a lot more than just user profiles. I'm using the profile as an example since this code is closely related to our middleware example earlier. I do want to point out that this may not actually help improve your performance in a production environment if you're using the simpler database cache backend. In this case, 
cache.get would do a database query. Then, if the profile is not in the cache, you do two more queries. One to fetch the object from the database, and another one to set it back in the cache. So we'd be doing three database queries instead of just one if we just got the profile from the database every time. Because fetching a profile is such a lightweight query, this would only increase performance if you're using the high performance caching backends. Now my favorite high performance caching backend is Redis, because it is both fast and offers some additional features. But Memcached would work just as fast and offer the convenience of being included as part of Django. If you're using either the Redis or Memcached backend, then the code demonstrated here would actually speed up your application. If your user profile is more than a simple query, then the database cache backend may be helpful. It's also fine to use a database cache in the development environment when you're using a high performance cache in production. Next, let's talk about managing the template cache. One great method to speed up your site is to use template caching. We'll focus on that during this video, but we'll also discuss some even higher level caching options. If you have a segment of your template that can take a while to process, you can use the cache template tag to cache it. Here's an example from the documentation. We begin by using the load cache tag. Then any part of our template that we want to cache, we simply wrap it in the cache tag. We pass in two parameters, the time in seconds for it to be cached, and then a name for the key in the cache. You can't use a variable name for the key, so in this case, the cache would just be sidebar. This can be very handy on pages with a lot of dynamic content. As a matter of fact, I'll frequently use a cache of 10 seconds on sites that can have big spikes in traffic. If I make a change to the website, it does mean it will take 10 seconds before the changes show up. But in most cases, that's fine. I've seen a lot of servers melt because there were hundreds or thousands of users hitting it each second during a rush. In those cases, a busy page on the site may cause so much database load that the site slows down to a crawl, maybe even crashing the server. By using caching in this way, database queries are reduced to being looked up only once every 10 seconds. Remember that Django does lazy loading of data, so even if you do a database query in your view, unless you access the results of that query, the query won't run until it's shown in your template. So it's okay to include database content inside the caching block. The database won't be accessed unless the cache timeout has occurred. If you have a blog application, you may have recent posts show up in the sidebar. Because that recent post section only changes once in a while, a delay of several seconds or minutes should be imperceptible. If you're creating a shopping cart application, you would probably not want to use this technique on anything that is user specific. For example, the icon that shows how many items are in the cart should not be cached. Before we wrap up this section on caching, I want to mention the benefits of caching at an even higher level. Your web server may support caching, or you may be able to use a cache in front of the web server. I frequently use Nginx and Varnish as front end caches. Using these types of caches can have a huge impact on the performance of your site but it is an all or nothing approach. If you have some pages on your site that rarely ever change, you can configure a front end cache to serve them from the cache for long periods of time. Most of these can be configured to have different cache expirations for different areas of your site. However, if your site has highly personalized content where different users see different content on the same page, a front end cache is not a good idea. Instead, use the caching techniques we've talked about here. In this section, we discuss low level caching using cache.get and cache.set. We've also learned how to use middleware for caching, and then we learned how to use the template cache feature. In the next section, we'll discuss model managers. In this section, we'll discuss using model managers to help keep your complex data operations dry and manageable. We'll discuss model managers in this video and in the next video, extend our knowledge so that we can use managers to create new objects. And finally, look at custom manage.py commands. Let's start out with an overview of managers. Every model has a manager. By default, it's called objects. In previous videos, we've looked up songs using the default manager. We use syntax such as song.objects.filter. I'm sure you've seen that numerous times and didn't really give it a second thought. If you have some special behavior you'd like to add, you can create your own manager and use it instead of the default one. You don't even have to call it objects, though I would stick with that name unless you have good reason to use something else. You can have multiple model managers, but I'd start out small and get more complex over time. Having heavily customized or multiple model managers can impact how the Django admin area works. Back in section four, we added a manager to our song and album models. We did this so that we could have a by year filter to show albums and songs for a certain year. 
When I'm creating reports, I frequently need to do common things again and again. For example, show data for the current month, the last year, and a rolling seven-day period. These are great examples of methods to add to my manager. As a matter of fact, because this rolling seven method for Song Manager requires no parameters, it can be used from within a template. We would simply call song.objects.rolling7 to get the songs added in the last seven days. You can do a lot with a manager. Essentially, you can overwrite any of the standard model behavior and add your own. However, there are things you can't or shouldn't do. For example, something that isn't a default capability is to filter database records for a particular user. Of course, you could create a method that requests a user ID as a parameter, but there's no way for the model to have access to the request parameter to automatically know which user the request is for. In the next video, we'll discuss using a manager to create new objects. Here's a situation you may have bumped into. We'll use our song model as a basis. You add a new song and you want to add the album and artist for the song at the exact same time. We can use a manager to do this for us. You're going to be surprised when you see how simple this code is. You see here that I've created a new model manager called New Song Manager. It gets all the behavior we just added to the song manager, and it adds a new method called New Song. Note that it takes a song title, artist, album, and release date. We use the get or create method for the artist and the album to either look up the PK or if that record doesn't exist to create a new one. Then we create a new song and save it. We then return the song. One of the best features here is that the code to create records is now no longer in a view. If you have several ways in which new songs may be added to the system, you never have to repeat your code. You can even add more sophisticated functionality in business logic here, which is pretty typical. Never repeat yourself again. Here's how to use it. Simply use song.objects.newsong and pass in the required fields. Next, let's talk about adding custom manage.py commands. There are times when you want to create your own custom management commands. One of the most common reasons is to have a scheduled task that runs at regular intervals. Let's start with the custom manage.py commands. When I use sessions, I notice over time my sessions table gets big. In recent versions of Django, there's a built-in command to clean this up for us but we'll create our own. For example, if you have special rules you want to apply. In order to create a management command, you have to create an app and then enable it in your installed apps. Then inside the app, you need to create a folder called management. It needs to be a valid Python model, so that means you do need the init.py. Inside that folder, you need to create another folder called commands. It also needs to be a module, so it also needs the init.py. Then, each file in this folder that does not begin with an underscore can contain a single management command. You see here, I've created two. One is called cleanup and the other is send report. If we look at cleanup, you'll see that it's pretty simple. There is a class that extends base command. It has help text and a single method called handle. You can, of course, create additional methods and you can include modules from your application or elsewhere. This is the bare minimum you will have to go through. This command simply pretends to do some cleanup and then writes to standard out that it is done. Notice that instead of writing to standard out, it uses self.standard out. In this case, it is a proxy for standard out that makes debugging easier. As you'd expect, there's also a self.standard error. Because I named this file cleanup.py, the command will be called cleanup. So if I drop to the terminal, I can type python manage.py cleanup. And it worked. Sometimes you want a command that accepts parameters. To illustrate this, I've created the send report command. This uses the add arguments method to define a parameter called report ID. It will accept integers. Note that this will come as a list because of the nargs option being sent through as plus. You see here in the handle method that I loop through the reports and declare that each was sent. I can then specify a list of reports to send on the terminal after the send report. You'll see that it loops through each of these and then declares them sent. In this video series, we had a common theme, one of the core principles of Django, don't repeat yourself. To achieve that goal, we discussed powerful class-based views, custom middleware, creating reusable template tags and filters, we showed how to use TastyPy to create a RESTful API. We used advanced database modeling techniques. We dug into caching. 
we use model managers, and we develop custom managed.py commands. It's been my pleasure to help you master Django. Thank you for watching.